Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. This is another beautiful day that the Lord has made, and uh, we'll rejoice together and be glad in it. Let's, if you will, uh, stand up, and we'll join together in worshiping the Lord. Bob. All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Minnehaha Church of Christ. We're glad to have each one of you here. Boy, it looks like a full house today. Somebody be sure and take a count. It's good to have you all. Well, there's people watching online too, and we want to welcome you as well, joining us online. Thank you for being here. My name is Dave Kubo, and you might have noticed things look a little bit different around here. We've got a different worship team. So, yeah, the A team is gone today. Sorry about that. But I think these guys sound great. They're great. <laughs> yeah. So we're the B team, but uh, we're glad you're here. Mike, Jimmy, and Lauren are up at the Avalanche Youth Rally in Deer Park, Washington. Oh, and did I mention that's where my son preaches? And uh, they're having a great time up there, I'm sure with uh, the youth together there. So please continue to pray for the effects of that rally. Even today, maybe silently, when you get a moment, just pray for the youth up there that they might turn their hearts toward Almighty God. That's what we want to see happen and what our Lord Jesus wants as well. We have a guest speaker today, Matt Shively. How many of you know Matt Shively? Great guy. Man, I just appreciate his life. You will notice that he's slightly handicapped, just a little bit, what? and he's not, <laughs> but he does amazing things. He works with his hands and builds things, hint, hint. and uh, he walks up here by feeling things, and he's not going to use his cane, so pray for him as he ascends the steps to the pulpit here today. We're glad to have Matt here today, and we're glad also that you guys are here in person and joining us online Today is October 8th, 2023, 2020, don't rush it. And this is, as Mike always says, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice. rejoice and be glad in it. That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be rejoicing every day for a new day that the Lord gives us. And I'm encouraged today because the Lord Jesus is with us. He's attending this congregation and every other congregation with us. He's in present with us. We'll partake, commune together in the Lord's Supper time a little bit later on, and we're partaking with him as we partake of the Lord's Supper until the day he returns again. We'll do that every Sunday. That's our practice here. You will notice uh, the bulletin. If you didn't get one, there's one in the back somewhere online. You can go to minihahachurch.org, download the bulletin, and you'll get the information that is there. And uh, by the way, um, you can even give online. 
Here we don't pass a plate or a bag as some churches do. We have a box in the back and your free will offerings are free will. We're not going to try to pressure you into giving any money. That's your between you and God. The same thing online. You can easily go to our website. There's a spot on the front page that says give and you can give online. Also, you can mention prayers. If you have prayers, there's, there's a card behind the pew there. You can fill out a, a prayer request. And I want you to know the leadership here prays for every prayer that comes in. You can do that online, too. There's a spot for a prayer request online. And you can list your prayer out there. And you can know, just know now, that the leadership here will be praying for you. All right, uh, upcoming, uh, there's a few things to be mindful of. October 14th, which is a Saturday, the ladies will be meeting here at the church at 7, or, or excuse me, at 9. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie goes, wait a minute, we don't come that early, 9 o'clock. And then on October 21st, this will be earlier, men's breakfast, we start at, I always wanted it to be 7 a.m., but I got complaints at 7.30 so come at 7.30, I'll probably be here at 7, and uh, we'll continue our study as in a series that we're going through right now. The fifth Sunday month, what does that mean? Yep, you're right, potluck. <laughs> so that's coming up. We're going to do that this month and the, the following month because we have a Thanksgiving meal that we do too. So prayer requests, page three in your bulletin list requests there. Uh, again, there's cards uh, in the back of the pew. You can do that. But I want to draw your attention to the uh, prayer requests that are in our bulletin that are mentioned and some that aren't mentioned there. Please continue to pray for those among us that are battling with cancer. Jerry Hastings, Janelle Judd, Roy Barker, and Roy Stewart. Please be in prayer for them. We'll pray in just a little bit for them as well. Also, Elliot Ryan, I didn't talk to Joyce beforehand, but he's currently in rehab after breaking some bones from a fall. Barbara Reif, not in your bulletin, but she broke her ankle and has had COVID. And Charles Daly is currently in the hospital and is recovering from a bout with COVID. One of the ways it affected him was with weakness. Although he is slowly improving, he specifically has requested that you please pray for his strength to return. And the entire family would appreciate this. Rose Williams called me yesterday morning and reported that Mark Williams is very sick. So please pray for him as well. Mark was scheduled to do these announcements and to do the Lord's Supper today. But again, the B team, I'm part of that B team. I'll be doing those duties uh, today. Also, Matt Shively, his wife Cindy is in the hospital of an incident the other night that is heart-related. Matt says it wasn't a heart attack, but possibly some blockage. So the doctors will do another test looking for the blockage on Monday. So please pray for her as well. Wow, what a mess we are, huh? <laughs> My. Well, the Lord is good. In spite of all of these circumstances in our life that happen to all of us at different times, we can still be thankful to our almighty God for blessing us and helping us and making everything work out for good for those that love him and are called according to his goodness. Let's pray right now. Would you join me? I'd like to ask you, those that are able to, please stand as we address our almighty God on behalf of these people. God almighty, we, we do thank you, God, for your blessings and your provision and making everything work out for good for those that love you and are called according to your purpose. And you know, Father, the the people among us, Jerry and Janelle, Roy Barker and Roy Stewart, who are suffering through this cancer battle that each of them have in their different ways, the doctors and in the way that they approach the treatments, I pray, God, that you would bless them, that you would give them the wisdom, 
that they need to help our brothers and sisters. Thank you, God, for that. God, we're thankful for you giving them the patience that they need to go through this difficult time. And I pray that you would strengthen them spiritually and physically at this time. And God, we thank you for the answered prayers as well as some improvements are taking place. And I thank you for you doing that and blessing these people. Ultimately, God, we know these people glorify you. And I pray that you would help them to be a great light in a dark world, even during their suffering and difficult times. Father, we pray for Elliot Ryan as well and help him to improve and, and, and gain strength as well as Barbara Rife. I pray, God, that you would help her and other people that are suffering from COVID and have gone through sicknesses. I pray, God, that you would bless them. And would you bless Charles Daly? Give him the strength that he desires at this time. God, we also pray for Mark Williams. Would you bless him and help him to heal and give Cindy the strength she needs during this difficult time as well? And I pray, God, that you would help the doctors understand and know what to do with her. And we pray that that would work smoothly on Monday and that we would see improvement. And God, so we pray that you would bless all these people as you obviously do each day. But God, would you make a special effort to help these individuals? That's our prayer this morning. And I pray that you bless our services now as we worship and as we honor you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Repeat the sound All his children 
clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children. Good God, his name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus. seated or remain standing, whichever you'd like. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a
Jordan? Yeah, there you go. Could you put that last verse, last slide up? Appreciate it. Yes. First line, all my life, you have been faithful. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper here shortly. There's a cup for both elements here. So there's, I don't know if you can see this, but in there is a little piece of bread. So one cup will have that. The other cup will have the juice. Now, because this is the B team, 
I forgot something. I forgot to get some servers to help. So I need a couple of volunteers to help serve the Lord's Supper. If you'd come up front, that would be appreciated. Thanks. Appreciate that. And uh, this time, we practice this at the Minnehaha Church of Christ here every Sunday. Uh, it does not get old because it's a good time to examine ourselves. It's a good time to remember what Jesus did for us and to remember something specific about our Lord. And this morning, I'd like to talk about the faithfulness of our God. All my life and your life, in everybody else's life, he has been faithful to us. We live in a world of unfaithfulness, uh, agreements. It used to be, and you old timers, I'm in this category, by the way, anybody with gray hair remembers, well, some of you don't have gray hair and you should, but like <laughs> Bob. But he would remember this too. A good old handshake was good enough for an agreement, wasn't it? And you used to say, okay, brother, like if I had an agreement between me and Ken Smithline here, I'd say, Ken, I promise you, I'll give you your car back when I get done with it. And he'd go, you know, I don't have to worry about that. We shook on it. That's the way it used to be. But not anymore. Uh, it, it's, it used to be good enough, but not anymore. An agreement it may or may not turn out. Marriage vows are easily broken in our day and age. Divorce is no big thing today, and, you know, everybody's doing it. Man has been unfaithful to God and fellow man in many ways. However, we didn't learn that from our great God. God has been faithful and will remain faithful to all of us throughout the ages, Listen to what the Bible has to say about our great God and his faithfulness. These verses should sink into your minds and stay there. God is faithful in keeping his covenant. Deuteronomy 7.9 says, Understand therefore that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant. For a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. He's faithful in keeping his covenant. He's faithful and he is just and fair. Deuteronomy 32, 3 through 4 says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. And everything he does is just and fair. He is faithful. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. Number three here, he is uh, faithful and loving. Uh, the faithful, unfailing love of God. His love is, is unfailing. And this comes out of Psalm 36, verse 5. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Regarding our temptations, we're all plagued with. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. But get this, and God is faithful he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. He's also faithful. He faithfully strengthens and protects. Second Thessalonians 3.3 3 says, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And he faithfully forgives us. First John 1 John 1.9 says, But if we... Confess our sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And he is faithful in love and mercy. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 to 25 says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. 
I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. He's faithful in love and mercy. As we think of the great faithfulness of our Lord, let our minds meditate and consider this following verse also in Lamentations. This comes from the same chapter, chapter 3, right after he said he's faithful, great in his, is his faithfulness, he's great in his mercies. This verse, verse 38 through 40 says, Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? Why should ev any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. And I say, how often do we complain? Yeah, we have no right to complain about anything. Uh, we need to examine and probe our ways. So, you know, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the Lord's Supper, that that's a time that we ought to examine ourselves, and it, and it is. And with that verse in mind, let us take an opportunity to meditate, meditate upon the great faithfulness of our Father in heaven, and then honestly evaluate ourselves at this time. God was faithful in sending Christ to the cross on our behalf. So let us examine and probe our ways, and may we be faithful to him as he is to us. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow or turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon and stars and their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness. So thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 besides. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's pray. God Almighty, we, we can't help but meditate upon the words we've heard from your word today of how great your faithfulness is to us. You never fail us. You always do what you say you will do. You are always there for us. You are so faithful to us. Who are we to complain about any of the issues in our lives? Knowing, God, about what you have done for us. You've given us everlasting life in Jesus Christ. He shed his blood, his very own blood for us. And he gave his body to be beaten and abused for us. Who are we to complain God, as we think about these things, we thank you so much for being that Father in heaven that is so faithful to us. May you bless us now as we partake of these emblems, and may you bless us in evaluating ourselves before you at this time. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
All right, this morning we have Matt Shively as our special speaker. And so would you, uh, I would say give him a, a handshake here. Uh, yeah, why don't we do that? Welcome, Matt, to the stage. God love ABC. A squad, B squad, and C squad. <laughs> so the A squad's not here, the B squad will work. If the B's not here, C squad quad will work. And neat thing, they're all on the same team, so I'm proud to be a B squad today. <laughs> My wife at the hospital said, well, how are you going to get to church on Sunday? I said, we got a truck, I'll just drive. <laughs> I was tempted. But I'm thankful that I got a neighbor that's watching over me like a hawk. Said, we'll take you there. So I'm here, now I just need to find a way to ride home. So if you let me borrow your car key, I'll be glad to assist. <laughs> Earlier this summer, we took a vacation in Redmond, Oregon, and we stayed there for a week. And before we came home, we visited a church. It was on Father's Day. This is outside of Redmond. I think it's Powell Butte Christian Church. And after we got done, my wife said, you got to check this out. they got a place structure. And I went over there, and there was a gentleman there built a wooden Model T truck. I think it's about three feet wide, six, seven feet long, and I put my hand on it, beautiful wood, carved and wheel, and allowed the kid to go on and play on it. I thought, this is kind of cool. So on the way home, I thought, you think I can make one of those? I had lots of leftover from the fence we built, and Jordan's going to show you slide number one, and here's how it looked like. The truck, the car or the boat? What's that? The car or the boat? Oh, okay. And, the car. and, of course, we put Spider-Man in there. And, and I made it for my grandson, who was two years old, and they're back in Georgia right now. And so we took a picture of that, and he's not happy. <laughs> what is that weird creature in my car? I said, Spider-Man, Spidey? Who's Spidey? <laughs> I want to show you the second one, but not yet. I know a brother, Roy Barker, you're in this room. Could you come up here and help me in this next presentation? He's thinking, uh-oh. About a month ago, his friend Bob Larimer posted about Roy's progress in the cancer, and it sounded like he was making great progress. In that post, he says something about, well, we're looking forward to going fishing again. And I was told that you want to go fishing, so Brother Roy is an elder, so they got me on another project. I thought, huh. And I heard a sermon about not only be Roy is a fisherman, but he's also a fisher of men. Now, October is the month of what? Appreciation of preacher and pastor. He's a pastor. He's an elder. So, Roy, I decided to honor you, and I think you might like what I just create. Okay. And I just couldn't resist this, and I think you're going to laugh, but I think you're going to love it. Because everybody I show said, this is great. I made him a rowboat. Uh, uh, go ahead and show the uh, picture so that those you can't see. Uh, what happened is, I, this is Roy fishing, and he used the bait. If you look at the bait, Roy, it looked like a, a cross. Amen. So you, he's, he's uh, using the gospel. Notice the anchors across, so we have anchor in Christ. Yep. And also, Roy, because he's such a good fisherman, he got a bucket full of fish. <laughs> now, Roy, I have to ask you a question. There's some small one and big one. So the small one that Bob catch and the big one you caught? Always. Always. So I just want to honor Roy, and I hope this encourages his life, and he's been a blessing in my life. And so, Roy... This is your gift for me, and the bag goes with you, too, so you can take care. God bless you. You know, Matt? Take it home, brother. You made me a cross, a wooden cross, one time, many years ago. I don't remember that. I still have it hanging on the mirror of my truck, hmm. my previous truck, my van. Is that the one Bob wrecked? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it through four different vehicles, and I mm -hmm. still got it today, and I appreciate it. I let that thing hang right there. Anybody gets in the truck, sees that, they know what they can expect. 
Good. Amen. Thank you, brother. Keep on, keep on fishing. That looks just like you, man. I just love giving gifts to people. And I made a mistake showing it last week at the branch, and I just said, I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to give it to because I want to keep it secret. And somebody said, can you make one for me? <laughs> okay. So I'm working on the second one. Don't ask. It's working. But I love to do what I do. I want to take a look at it. The topic might be strange to you to talk about the biblical worldview, the story of William Wilberforce. Perhaps you heard that name because the movie came out in 2007 about him. And what's interesting that today our culture, if you know that, it's going downhill and it's getting darker. One of the verses that popped in my hand in my head is Roman 1. I think around verse 20, what God says, He's going to judge those who are godless and wicked, who suppress the truth with their wickedness. Are we seeing that? Oh, we've seen that every day. Brother, Roy, uh, Brother Dave's going to be reading two more scriptures to deal with our culture here. And the first one is John 15, 18 to 25. And then he's going to read the second one in 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 12 to 19. Brother Dave, read and listen see that describes where we are today. John 15, 18 through 25. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word... They will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. <laughs> if I, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> had not done, <coughs> excuse me. Remember, he's a bee squad. It's <laughs> a little bit of that cracker in my throat. <laughs> you went down the wrong hole. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> if I... <coughs> Jordan? <laughs> Remind me I volunteered to somebody to read. Yeah. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sin. But they but now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. All right, I'm going to try the next one, Matt. <clears throat> First Peter 4, 12 to 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name's sake, uh, for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, 
those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Thank you, Dave. There the passage I want to bring up that comes to my mind, John 10.10, 10, the thief with the devil comes to do what? Steal, kill, destroy. It's happening right now, and the question is, what are you going to do about it? Every year it's getting worse and worse, and yet we are being attacked left and right. Christianity is no longer cool. I was born in 1961, and that's when the Americans slowly started going downhill. And in 62 and 63, the court, the Supreme Court decided to say that the prayer and the Bible is unconstitutional. Never mind, we had it for 300 years. Some of those judges that are probably atheists don't understand the concept that it was wrong. And to read their document, it says the reason why it's unconstitutional is that it might cause psychological brain damage. <laughs> so I should put out a sign up here and say, today this message might cause brain damage as you listen to me, okay? You've been warned. 30 years ago, David Barton took a hold of that. What difference did it make? Well, if you look at the prayer, it's pretty bland. All it said is, God bless the teacher, student, parents, and, and country. Amen. I want to ask those guys who passed that ruling, you don't want God to bless these four areas? And in 1990, he showed a chart. Ever since they took the Bible and prayer out, everything went up. Brother Dave talked about it. Divorce, violence, uh, you name it. Skyrocket, right after they took that out. Sure, it made a difference. In 73, they passed the abortion, so it's okay to murder our baby. I think between one and two million had died every year. In 1980, they passed another Supreme Court. They did not allow to have the Ten Commandments on the wall of the school. Why? Well, somebody might obey it. Hmm. Thou shalt not murder. So you don't want them not to obey it, and today, in the last 25 years, what we get, people? Killing in the school. But hey, we don't want them to obey that, right? And in the last 10 years, the things that just got worse and worse in regards to the pride movement and gay movement and the misunderstanding of our gender, and it's just getting crazier. And both politics on both sides are corrupt. And, and it's just wrong some of the laws they're passing. Right now, I know several, more than a dozen people left the state of Washington because of some of the law they're passing. I don't blame them. I don't judge them. We had that conversation. But before we make that decision, the second conversation is, where did God want me to be? And I'll do that a little bit later, why that question is so critical. Some of you may have heard the name Joe Kennedy a high school coach eight years ago was fired because after the game in Seattle, he'd go out there quietly, gone on a knee, and pray. Oh, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. So they fired him. He went to the Supreme Court, won the case, and went back to work this year. So did the school respect him? No, they wouldn't give him a locker. They wouldn't give him the shirt with the logo for the school. They told the other coaches, ignored him. They told the football player, don't listen to him. I heard the interview of him about a month ago on Glenn Beck, him and the lawyer, and he decided to quit and go somewhere else. That's the world we live in, people. Violence is on the rise. Churches are accepting unbiblical principle. It's dark. So the question is, what do we do about it? I found out with one of my brothers did some research that 4,500 churches closed every year in the last few years. Oh, sure, we plant 3,000 new churches, but I'm part of the new church plant. It is hard. And even in our area, we had to close four churches that had been planted in the Northwest. It's just difficult since of COVID. What do you do about that? And if you mention Christianity, you'd be sued and trying to make it outlaw. Well, that's why I want to bring in William Wilberforce. He'll give us hope how we should handle this. Because we could easily take the white towel and say, we might as well just surrender. No. 
there's hope. You know, I want to show you a man who made it different. You thought our culture is bad? Let me take you back 250 years. William Wilberforce was born back in 1759. He lived up to, to 1833 in England and the British. When he was nine years old, he was the only child, his dad died. And then his mom's not feeling well, and they weren't sure she was going to make it alive. And, and William was a very rich family he grew up, a very high society. They had lots of money to do very well. Well, their mom and their grandparents said, well, since we're not sure your mom's going to live, let's send them to their aunt and uncle. They're very rich. So he went over there, and what unknown to the other family, they were Christian. And for the first time, they introduced Christianity to William Ford. And he caught on, and he grew in love. And then at age 12, the grandparent and the mom found out, and said, whoa, that's not a good idea. Because in that society, you don't become a Christian. The thought back then is nobody who had lots of money in a high society don't want nothing to do with Christianity. Because 100 years ago, they see all the, quote, quote, religion, Christian war. Bad news. Now, they go to church, but you keep the subject within the building. You don't dare share the gospel. And the grand Paul said, you keep it up, buddy. You're not going to get a penny from me when I die. Well, they grab him back, and they try to flush out Christianity. And at age 16, he went to college, Cambridge. And during those four years, he met a young man named William Pitt. William Pitt, his dad, was one of the top person in the parliament, parliament rising star. And his son wanted to be part of that. So Pitt and Wilberforce will go there and watch from the gallery, kind of like us going to D.C. and watching the debate between the Senate and Congress. And William got the bug, ah, I want to be part of that politician someday. And those four years in college, he got deeper and deeper away from Christianity. And Isn't that interesting when our children rose up in the church and you sent them away to the secular college, and how many of them have fallen away? It happened today and it happened back then. So he did ran in when he was only 20, and he won. His friend, William Pitt, also won. These two guys rode quickly. These guys are sharp, and they're good, what they are. Uh, William is very good as a speaker. He's a great singing voice like Bob. He's very intelligent, and he had lots of money, and he was doing, going places. But Christianity is not in the card. In 19... In 1784, both of these guys are very popular, so they can travel everywhere. So they decided to take a trip down in France for about several weeks, 1,200 miles. But he wanted a companion because he get on this coach and he wanted to be with somebody all day. So he had to pick a couple guys because whoever he pays, it's going to be a lot of conversation. One of the doctors bailed out, and then he checked with the other guy. His name's Isaac uh, Gilbert Milder. Milder. He's a professor, one of the brightest teachers in one of the schools he went. And he accepts, because he'll pay for all the expense. I'll go. And after a week on that road, Professor Isaac introduced Christianity. And Wilberforce goes, whoa, 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 you're crossing the line. No, we're not. And so they had an honest debate. And at the end of the trip, which is several weeks, Wilberforce realized he's right, I'm wrong. He decided to return to Christianity. He had a problem. He went back and said, what am I supposed to do with this? Now, I forgot to tell you that when he went to his aunt and uncle, he met John Newton. John Newton showed up to the place, and he got to become a friend, and almost accepting as a, a father. And John Newton looked down on William, for, they call him Willie, Billy, and he said, kind of like his son. But they haven't seen each other for many years, and so he decided to Go see him secretly, kind of like Nicodemus went to see Jesus. Don't want anybody to know. Because he's in high society. He's well known. He don't want people to know what he's doing. John Newton was excited to find out he returned to the faith. Wilberforce was not because he was rationing the idea, okay, the politician is wicked, corrupt. Shall I just quit and become a preacher? And John said, perhaps not. Maybe God put you there so you can do something about it. Okay. He went back, 
and he used to be part of five of the what they call the men uh, society, and all they do is drink and gamble. That society back there is really bad because pretty much everybody's drunk. And the men of the pyramid don't spend time with the children. I mean, that culture, there is no, I repeat, no biblical world view in that country at all. And so he decided to, okay, I'm going to follow God. But it took him a year and a half to do some research. He said, okay, in regard to become a Christian, he's all in. Lord, what is it you want me to do? So he wrote down the 20 words, two commitments he's going to make. One, Get rid of the slave tray. Second, restoration of manners. Well, you know the first one, because some of you saw the movie, how he dealt with that, but that only part of the story. The second part is the restoration of manner, meaning immoral, God, ungodly living. 25% of the single women are prostitutes, average 16. Kids who are five, six years old working 10, 12 hours a day. If you get caught with certain law, it was a minor, they execute you. In other words, it's just crazy. The prison is really bad. And there's just so many issues, and it's just miserable. And there is no God anywhere. And Wilberforce made a decision to get rid of the slave trade and help change society and spread the gospel. So he did. It took him 18 years to overturn the slave trade. If you were in that battle, how long would you last? A year or two? But he never quit. He kept at it and kept at it because he knew this is God's will. And in, 19, in 1891, he got a letter from John Wesley where he wrote the letter, and then, of course, John passed away three days later, he was 87, and said, I see you're still fighting. Don't quit, but recognize you can't battle this on your own. The only way you're going to win this battle between the evil man and the Satan is to have God with you. If God sees that this is your goal, it's going to happen. Stick with it. Don't quit. I mean, he had a battle with health issues. He had a battle with all these people attacking him. His life was threatened, and, and yet he kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. And besides, only that he went after the slave trade because he keep bringing it up and keep losing the boat again and again and again. But he didn't quit. And of course, what's interesting, his friend, William Pitt, became the prime minister back there. They were only 25 years old. Both of these guys are a star. But he recognized that I need to change the culture in order to help the people to ban the slave trade. He had to educate the people. I want to show you a video that came from the clip from the movie. This is one of the things that Wilberforce had to do. He had to, in order to change the government, you got to change the mind of the people, let them know that this is the right direction. It is wrong to bring these slaves in. Take a look at this clip as one of his approach how to turn the country around. This trip wasn't purely arranged to reward those MPs who have supported me in the past year, nor am I the only sponsor. What is she doing up there? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a slave ship to Madagascar. It has just returned from the Indies, where it delivered 200 men, women and children to Jamaica. When it left Africa, there were 600 on board. The rest died of disease or despair. That smell is the smell of death. Slow, painful death. Breathe it in. Breathe it deeply. Take those handkerchiefs away from your noses. There now. Remember that smell. Remember the Madagascar. 
remember that God made men equal. He also wrote a book in 1796 and 97 about Christianity, how to live. And then he kept finding a way he traveled and speaks and educate the people. So more and more people are turning toward God and more and more people recognize that slave is wrong. The reason why they don't want to give it up because the love of the money is the root of what? All evil. It's pure evil, people, because they want the slave, they want that power, they want that money, they will not give it up. So Wilberforce kept going after and educate people turned them to God, he spread the gospel. Not only did he spend time working on the slave trade, get rid of it, he's also on the other area where he helped missionary in Africa. He set up a ministry for the homeless people, for the, uh, the single mom. And, and he did, he always carried a whole bunch of money and always giving people in need. He helped a lot of preachers in trouble or had health issues. The guy just gave everything he got. He's humble and he stuck with it. Finally, in 1807, he won. And then in 1807, the law finding intimate that no more enslaved trade, but they recognized that some of those people are still going to break the law. So he spent the rest of his life dealing with that. And just before he died in 1833, three days before he died, he got a messenger from the parliament, said, we got it, they outlaw the slave Permanently. Amen. It took him the whole lifetime to turn around. One man. That culture is worse than our culture. We still have some biblical worldview. He did not. And I'm still reading some of the book, and I'm just encouraging, you know, there's still hope. We can still turn this thing around. But how? I want to share you some principles that, remember, he's not a lone ranger. One of the things that Wilberforce made him successful is, number one, it's prayer and Bible study. You've got to do that, and you spend one or two hours. Now, I know that's going to hit you guys hard, but I don't have time for that, all right? Let me give you a different illustration and wake you up. And just, if we're serious about changing the culture, you've got to be ready. Your five-minute prayer and Bible study is not going to cut it. Let me give you an example. If I'm in Bible college and I only spend five, ten minutes studying for the test, I'm not going to make it. Can you do that? In high school, I play football. So if I show you practice five minutes a day, and I know what's going to happen on the first game day, I'm going to get hurt or I'm not going to be effective. Brother and sister, in order to battle the issue we have, you need to have God's word and prayer, and you got to spend some quality time. Just like when I study for the test, i got to put the time in to do well. In order to be a good football player, i got to hit the field and practice. The five, ten minutes not going to cut it. That's how Wilberforce did. He didn't do the five, ten minutes. He really took it seriously in that aspect. John 15 talked about Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You cannot do anything without me. In order to get the power of God, you got to be plugged in. The second thing he did, he memorized scripture. From time to time, he'll walk home from the government house, his, his home. It's about two and a half miles. And halfway, he recited and memorized a whole chapter of Psalm 119. If you have not looked it up, it's a large chapter. And he went over and over and over. The other thing you need to recognize in order to, to change this culture, to be serious, is preparedness. Wilman Forrest, he was good in his speaking, he was witty, he was sharp, but yet he kept Ken working and growing. He had to understand how the politics would work. He had to understand how to talk to the people. He had to understand the scripture to share to God. And then he grow in that. And God, listen to me. God will not use unprepared people. If you're here and you're sitting in the pew and you're waiting for God to do something, no, he's waiting for you to be prepared. Okay, he used prepared people. For example, when I first moved down here after art school and 
they were tugging my heart to go to Bible college. I, I did not want to go because I already had five years of college. I, I, I'm done. I want to go to work. And God said, no, no. I want you to go to college, Bible college. I said, no. He said, yes. I said, no. He said, yes. And he won. I said, all right, God, I'll, I'll go for one year. But my one year turned into six or seven, and I realized that God was not going to let me go, so I needed to prepare because I thought one of the reasons I didn't want to go is I, you know, when you go to Bible college to be a preacher, and I'm not the guy. I'm going blind. I'm deaf. You got the wrong man. You need to grab somebody like Dave Kubel. He's the right guy, not me. He's the A squad. I'm, the, I'm not even on the team, right? Not according to God. And so after I recognized that God pulled me in that direction, I got busy. I went to speech therapy because I got to deal with that issue. I joined Toastmasters so I can do a better presentation. Homiletic, I go into Bible. In other words, I was preparing myself to see where God is going to take me. And out of the blue, after three years, after going to the camp the first time, Myron Well pulled me over and said, you need to take your message on the road. I have no clue. That's my second sermon in my lifetime. And you want me to go on the road? You're, you're kidding. I don't know anything about that. Thank God that Brother Charles Daly was the elder of the preacher, and I went to him and said, where did I go from here? And he was my mentor. He helped me launch my ministry back in 88. To this day, I still travel to school, churches, camp. I have no idea, but I was trying to prepare myself, and then God used me. I have no idea that's going to happen. I love drama. Get involved in lots of Christian drama, and then God led me to be a drama dragon. And then we're the preparedness. So what are you doing? See, when we look at Wilberforce, don't compare yourself to Wilberforce. The question you should ask is, what are you doing that God gives you? Are you using your gift? I'm not asking you to be like Wilberforce. I'm not asking you to be like me as a preacher. But I am asking, did God call you a certain area where you can help turn the culture? I can preach because I've been trained. You saw the woodworking. I, I love doing that. I can do that to encourage people, to bless people. What is it that God gave you that you can impact our culture? He needs you, but only if you're willing to take those gifts he gave you and move forward. Another thing that made Wilberforce so powerful, he really took this seriously. And this is the area that we struggle the most. I'm pointing the finger right at me. Brother Dave Kuh will talk about it at Sunday school. Love your enemy. Oh, that's tough. Wilberforce was humble. And he was gracious to the people on the other side of the aisle. He never pushed him over the fence. He persuaded his way. They didn't like his lecture, but they loved him because he's always been gracious to the other side. Matter of fact, he's willing to work with a guy named Charles Jane Fock, who was just the opposite of everything except for the slave trade. He said, I'll work with you. He didn't use his higher moral standards to, well, because you do all this evil thing, I'm not going to work with you. No, he worked with everybody he can. This guy is a good friend of the uh, Prince Whale, which is the elder son of Charles III, the king. He ramped it. He conquested. So I have 7,000 women I conquest. And he brag about it and think it's cool. And yet Charles worked with William Ford because his grace. So he learned to love his enemy because for the first five years, he recognized he was a problem. And he wanted to demonstrate grace to everybody he worked with. I remember in my Bible study in prayer, I pick up the book written by Don D. Weld, The Sweet Hour of Prayer. He pray in Bible study two hours every morning. 30 years ago, I did a Sunday school, and I brought this up. said, you know, one of the days I'd like to pray all night. i never done that. Could Jesus do that? he pray all night. I thought, I'd like to try that. And one of the brothers came and said, Matt, when you do that, let me know. So we did. It was around New Year's time. We came here at the church building, 10 o'clock, and the, where Mike Rooms is, it was a library. So we're going to pray from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
using the format of three-hour prayer, can you break it down? Because sometimes we struggle 10 minutes, right? Half an hour. What do we pray about? Well, when you look at Don D. Wilt outline, it helps you break it down. It turned out at 6 a.m. I ran out of time. For example, we set two hours praying for all the people in the church. We had about 150. I only got one third done. I go, whoa. And we did it. And it's kind of cool. So if you're not sure how to do that, pick up that sweet hour prayer to give you some clue. Brother and a sister, our culture is just going downhill real fast. But because of what William Wilberforce did, he changed the culture. Somebody said George Washington is famous here, and, and, and the historical said Wilberforce was more famous than Washington and all put together because of what he did here because his influence spread throughout the whole world. For example, a lot of those fathers don't spend time with the kids, and he had sick kids, and he'd go home on Sunday and spend time with the kids. He's trying to let them know that goodness is good. So what are you going to do? I challenge us to consider what Wilbur Force did, and we too can take that same direction that he did and make a difference. The other thing, he never did it alone. He had other brother and sister pray for him. He always gathered around with other brother. And every time he had a different issue, he said, pray for me. I'm going in here. He never did it alone. He had mentors. He talked to other people. He had lots of support. There's so much that we can learn from him that we too can turn this country around. There is a chance. I'm thinking of Galatians 6, 9 that said, do not become weary by doing good. Good means sharing the gospel. Good means learning to forgive others. Good means to love your enemy. Good means to be godly and righteous and love God. We can do that by starting to change the biblical worldview started in your family, your neighbor, our city, our county, our state, and yet, our nation. We may be just one person. And, and keep in mind, once we engage what we're doing, when God calls you to go that direction, you may not see the end result. Remember, it took us 50 years to overturn the abortion law. So whatever engagement that God asks you to go for, you may not be around long enough to see the end result, but maybe your kid and your grandkid will see the change. It doesn't happen overnight. It took us 62 years to get where we are. This world is a mess, but we got a God that changed and he's waiting on you and me. Will you join me? Oh, it's hard. Because I know I've got some stuff to work on. Because I want to help change the country and bring back the biblical worldview. But it takes commitment. It takes obedience to God and listen to his word and follow. So whatever God call you, are you willing to go? And I hope you join me as we make our country turn toward God once again. Let's pray. Father, I know our world is just a mess. So much violence, hate towards you. We see a lot of law that is anti-Christ and unbiblical. We see that the truth is being suppressed by wicked people, evil people, corruption. It's everywhere. We see a lot of churches that closing their door. We see churches that are not standing on the biblical truth. So we ask God, help us to make a difference. You did it in Wilberforce. His culture was way worse than ours, and you turned that culture around like nothing else. I like to pray that it will happen again. So I ask the congregation here and those who are viewing to search your heart and find out where God wants to use them in a mighty way. I could easily use my disability and say, I can't do this because I'm blind and I'm deaf, but that's not good enough for you, God. You know that I can do more. 
So I pray that let's not look at our weakness for excuse not to move forward, but look at your strength by using our weakness to make your name glorified throughout this nation. Each one of us has different gifts. And I pray that you open our eyes and see, God, how can I be used? How can I be part of the church that can make a difference in our home, in our country? And God, forgive us for not obeying your word and to make a difference. We give you praise and glory. And I am so thankful for the man of William, William Wilberforce, for his testimony, for his love. And we can learn from him. And we can see his principle, and we can do the same principle that he done in our life. And I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do in this country. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And thank you for allowing me to speak this message to the congregation here as they can look forward that there is hope and there is power in you. And all the people say, Amen. and the praise team is going to come up and close with a song. So. Thank you, Matt. I believe the name of the movie was Amazing Grace. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. That's, I'm going to have to see it again. It was very powerful. That song was written by a man who was a son of a slave trader and a slave trader himself. And once he was blind, but then God opened his eyes, and he worked with William Wilberforce. And Great Britain was before us in stopping slavery. It was totally a Christian movement. And also, like Matt was saying, they had a tremendous influence on society. There was terrible conditions for children and poor people, and uh, horrible prison reform was needed, and there was crime. And because of their Christian influence, they really made a big difference in Great Britain and change that society around. If they can do it, we can do it. Please rise to your feet and we'll sing together.
bless you and go with you all week. You're dismissed.